So this is the title of my talk, my disclosure, of course, and the outline uh, today for today's uh, talk. So I would like to divide my talk in five parts. The first part will be devoted to rapid administration of uh, antibiotic in the ICU patients suspected of having developed a, a bacterial infection, and this is one of the key issues, uh, as, as you know. Secondly, of course, this is not uh, an easy task in the ICU to diagnose infection. Bombing ICU patients with antibiotics could be sometimes detrimental, and we will review together some data showing that. <coughs> could be the way to improve our diagnostic and management strategy would be uh, uh, to base our microbiological approach using the new technologies, and finally, how to do a better job, maybe. So you probably saw this slide a lot of time. As you know, we have a lot of very strong, solid data showing that the appropriateness of antimicrobial therapy is really a key issue in the ICU in patients with septic shock, whatever the site of infection. Pneumonia, intra-abdominal infection, skin and soft tissue infection, UTI, uh, 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 and so on. In every type of infection, uh, the appropriateness of antimicrobial therapy is directly related to survival, as you can see on the slide. But not only we need to be appropriate, adequate, as soon as possible, and this is also a key issue, any delay in uh, the time interval between the onset of infection and the first administration of antibiotics uh, will impact uh, uh, dramatically uh, the prognosis, as shown in this very well cited uh, a study by Dr. Kumar from Canada. And therefore, based on those data, we have very strong recommendation from the surviving sepsis campaign, but also from any uh, guidelines recommending that the administration of IV antimicrobial should be initiated as soon as possible, which is within one hour. This is a very strong recommendation, as you know. The quality of evidence is good, moderate at least, and uh, as indicated on the slide, we need to be able to do that whatever uh, the condition of the patient. Interestingly, because as you know, there are still some controversies regarding that point. Should we really uh, um, uh, recommend to start antibiotics within one hour. We have some data, for example, in community acquired pneumonia, showing that, <coughs> of course, the timing is important, but going too fast could be also detrimental sometimes. So this is a, a very important study, very recently published in the Blue Journal a couple of uh, uh, weeks ago. This is a retrospective study, but of a very large number of patients in the US, in 21 emergency departments. Patients were enrolled between 2010 and 2013. Importantly, this study was restricted to patients having received antibiotics within six hours, and the median time to antibiotic administration was only 2.1 hours. So in that setting, in a context uh, when the antibiotics were administered very early in the course of the disease, even in that context, the adjusted odds ratio for hospital mortality was really associated with uh, each hour elapsed uh, between registration to the emergency department and the antibiotic administration. Of course, 
there was an increase in the absolute mortality associated with each early delay in antibiotic administration for septic shock patients, of course. But also, and this is to my knowledge the first time that it was really shown in the literature, even in patients with severe sepsis or sepsis only, using the old definitions, it was also possible in that study to demonstrate the benefit associated with early administration of antibiotics. This is uh, 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 one of the figure clearly showing that if it's possible to give antibiotics within one hour, the mortality is lower than after two or three hours, with maybe a plateau between two and four hours. But, and this is a major issue, the diagnosis of infection in the ICU is difficult. And as you know, clinical features do not reliably distinguish bacterial infection from many other entities. This is particularly evident, for example, in patients with ventilator-associated pneumonia. As indicated on the slide, for the usual signs and symptoms we are using at the bedside for diagnosis pneumonia uh, in mechanically ventilated patients, whatever the sign or symptom, fever, abnormal uh, leukocytosis, purulent sputum, crepitations, hypoxemia, or a new infiltrate, the negative likelihood ratio is pretty close to one, as well as the positive ratio. And therefore, we are left with a lot of uncertainties. As a consequence, many ICU patients receive unnecessary antibiotics treatment, as well as other patients should uh, not receive the antibiotics uh, their request. So we are doing probably a lot of mistakes in the ICU. And we have a lot of data showing that the administration of antibiotics is really not so good in the ICU and in the hospital. We are overusing antibiotics and also misusing antibiotics. This is one of the many studies having clearly documented that issue. As you can see, in that study, a lot of patients receive antibiotics in the, in the ICU and in the hospital, roughly 60% of the patients. Of those patients, at least maybe one third receive antibiotics without any signs or symptoms of infection. Appropriate cultures were collected in roughly only 60% of the cases. And more interestingly, in 58% of the cases, those specimens were completely negative. And nevertheless, the patients were, were treated with antibiotics. And no de-escalation at all was done in that study. In only 20, 21 percent of the cases, the antimicrobial therapy was uh, uh, re-evaluated on day five, not on day two or three, but on day five. So clearly, we are overusing antibiotics and also misusing antibiotics, particularly in the ICU. And as I said before, Bombing ICU patients with antibiotics can be detrimental. It can drive the emergence of MDR pathogens, of course, but also it can render difficult or even impossible to identify the microorganisms responsible for the infection, leading to suboptimal therapy, particularly 
when the infection is caused by a difficult to treat microorganism. As you know, this is a key issue. We need to be able to isolate the pathogen responsible for the infection in order to be able to treat appropriately the infection. And bombing ICU patients with antibiotics could also mask the true diagnosis and or delay the control of the infection source. And there is also a large possibility for inducing severe adverse effects. As you know, it's not possible using antibiotics to escape to a big selection pressure at the level of the site of infection, but more importantly, at the level of the microbiota uh, in the digestive tract for example. And as you know, what you will do after two or three days of antibiotics, you will select at least one uh, microorganism resistant to uh, the antibiotics you are, given to, you are giving to the patient. No way to escape at all. And this is probably the major explanation for the emergence and dissemination of MDR, XDR pathogens we are seeing worldwide. This is the data in Asia, but this is exactly the same data in Europe, in the US. So this is really a worldwide issue, of course. As I said before, using, overusing antibiotics could be very detrimental. The safety of antibiotics is not so good, in fact. And we have also a lot of data showing that the overuse of antibiotics is driving, for example, the emergence of Clostridium difficile infection in the ICU and also driving uh, some severe other adverse effects. This is an interesting study done a couple of years ago, more than uh, 17 days, uh, years, in, in fact. And as you can see, in that very specific study, it was possible to document that anti-infective drugs were responsible for deaths in, a, in many patients. And it was not suspected before the autopsy data as done in that study. So sometimes, maybe, Rushing too much, maybe a little bit hazardous. The way to go could be uh, to base our diagnostic strategy on some uh, new microbiological approaches. Of course, we have now a lot of new technologies going from PCR techniques to uh, the Malditov technology which is a very clever technology, as you know. Using these technologies, it's possible to identify very rapidly in a couple of hours the microorganisms responsible for uh, the infection. At least, if it's possible to, good, to have a good specimen uh, initially, which is also a very important issue. So using those new techniques, it's possible to do a better job, of course. And this is a, a, a diagram uh, comparing a conventional approach based on conventional microbiological cultures and a new approach based on PCR technology or the Malditov technology. Using those new techniques, it's possible to get the pathogen identification after roughly uh, less than one day. And also to get the susceptibility patterns a couple of hours later on. So you will gain a lot of time for improving the administration of antibiotics. You will confirm the infection earlier and you will also get the data you need for improving the antimicrobial therapy a little bit earlier compared to the conventional techniques. And we have now a, launch, uh, a, 
a large body of evidence showing that at the bedside, using this technology, it could be possible to improve the survival of the patient. This is one of the best studies done, having evaluated uh, the potential utility of the Malditoff technology in that study, for example. But very importantly, to get the benefit associated with those new technologies, you need to have a very good relationship with the lab, of course, and with the antibiotic stewardship uh, team also. As you can see on the slide, using this Malditoff technology, it will be possible to narrow the coverage, the initial coverage, in roughly one third of the patient. Not so bad. It will be also possible to discontinue antibiotics, completely discontinuing antibiotics in roughly one third of the patient because no bugs at all were identified in that study using this technology. And also, very importantly, using the information collected by uh, uh, that technique, you will be able to improve the initial antimicrobial therapy very early in the course of the disease in roughly 25% of your patients. So a big benefit regarding uh, uh, antibiotic, antibiotic management. And interestingly, in that study, as you can see, using uh, the results, it was possible to improve the antimicrobial therapy, as I showed you a couple of minutes ago, but also to increase the survival of the patient. And we have now a meta-analysis of all the studies done using these new technologies, Malditoff or PCR or other uh, biomolecular uh, technology, in that meta-analysis, as you can see, the survival of the patient was improved compared uh, to a conventional strategy. But as I said before, only when it was possible to associate this new technology with a good antibiotic stewardship team. So the benefit is obtain only when there is a very good relationship between the lab and the ICU doctors. Because of course, if you have no good relationship between the two uh, uh, teams, you will not get the benefit associated with that. How is it possible to do a better job in the ICU? First, you need to have a very high index of suspicion of infection. As I said, the diagnosis sometimes is not so clear cut. And particularly, as you know, in patients with sepsis, severe sepsis or septic shock, in a lot of patients, more than 10% of the patient, uh, the diagnosis is not so clear cut. And particularly, for example, fever is not present, as shown in that recent study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So the absence of fever should never, never exclude the diagnosis of a bacterial infection in the ICU. Always obtain a very good biologic specimen for gram staining and cultures before before starting new antibiotics. This is really a take home message. In many ICUs, in many hospitals, doctors are starting new antibiotics after, uh, without, sorry for that, so without having collected uh, a good specimen for the lab. And this is a major mistake, of course. As you know, if you are doing that, starting new antibiotics 
before getting pulmonary secretion, for example, in a patient with a clinical suspicion of ventilator-associated <coughs> pneumonia in the ICU, it's too late. Only one dose of antibiotic will decrease the bacterial burden in the lung. And therefore, you will not get the information you need for improving the antimicrobial therapy. So never do that. As you know, okay, we need to give antibiotics as soon as possible, but getting a good specimen takes only a few minutes, okay? Whatever the site of infection. So please never do that. You need to start antibiotics very early in the course of the disease. This is absolutely clear, but before, you need to get a good specimen for the lab. Don't forget to ask for a gram staining. This is a very old technique, but this is a very efficient technique to prove first the reality of the bacterial infection. This is one example of a uh, 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 BL, a bronchoalveolar lavage fluid gram stain, obtained in two patients with a suspicion of pneumonia. As you can see, using a gram staining, after less than 30 minutes, you will have a very good indication that there is really a pulmonary infection in those patients and you will get also some information regarding the microorganisms responsible for the infection. Make explicit your diagnostic and therapeutic strategies, including the selection of the initial therapy. Whatever the clinical strategy you will use, it's probably possible to use only a clinical strategy for example, for diagnosing pulmonary infection in the ICU. This is a very easy strategy, but of course, and this is very important, you need to have an explicit decision tree regarding how you will manage antibiotics in that setting. And you need to be able on day two or day three, when you get the information from the lab regarding the results of the cultures, you should be able, at least in some patients, explicitly to say, yes, in that case, I will discontinue antibiotics. We do a lot of mistakes regarding the initial antimicrobial therapy, as shown on the slide in that study. And this is not so easy to uh, uh, to select the initial therapy. There are a lot of factors that you need to take into account as indicated on the slide. As said, in many guidelines, it's probably necessary in many, many patients to start with a very large broad spectrum therapy with at least one, but probably in most cases, at least two antibiotics, particularly in patients with sepsis or septic shock. You need to use two antibiotics because as you know, we are now facing a lot of difficult to treat microorganisms. And using two antibiotics, of course, you will broaden the spectrum of your antibiotics. And at least this is a key issue when the infection is caused by a difficult to treat pathogen. Using initially, initially two antibiotics you will also probably improve the efficacy, the bacterial killing of your regimen, at least in patients with a severe disease. Because as you know, this benefit using two antibiotics is only obtained in patients with a, a, a pretty high probability of mortality, roughly above 25%. And finally, you need to monitor and to control that you are really doing in your own ICU what you say you, 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 you do. This is exactly as 
in a plane. You need a checklist and also a copilot just to make sure that you are following an explicit decision tree in that setting. So thank you so much for your attention.